So uh, thank you, Lauren. And, and the Caring for Carson Knight Foundation is really a fantastic uh, group. I'm also involved with American Cancer Society, another fantastic group. But it's, it's nice to have a group that's really focused on the research and the needs of a rare disease. So now I'm going to do what my, is my favorite part of it. <laughs> and you have to indulge me, unless you sneak out. Um, my favorite part of the session is to talk about research. And I'm going to talk generically about research. And I'll let uh, Pam talk about some of the clinical trials that are more specific for neuroendocrine. But just to give you sort of a, of a broader view of how we think about uh, clinical research, and again, defining some terms that uh, you may hear about but you may not be familiar with. So um, when we talk about clinical research, we actually really have to start with some preclinical modeling or some rationale as to why we would test a specific treatment in a disease. And uh, that rationale is usually having those tumor cells grow in a Petri dish and showing that drug X, Y, and Z works better than drug A, B, and C. And then we say, well, let's go test X, Y, and Z in patients. Or better yet, having tumors that grow in the sides of mice and demonstrating that those drugs work and we know why they work because we can study the molecular mechanisms of those drugs and then use those in, in patients. Problem is, as uh, Lauren alluded to, we don't have good, good uh, mouse models. And that's a problem, that's a major problem for this field. So how do we go from there? Well, we have to take hunches. And we will then take a drug, which I alluded to the first, uh, in the first talk in the morning, talking about the hypervascularity of the tumors. Why not attack the vasculature? That's what the angiogenesis inhibitors do. Uh, the arterial uh, blood supply, why not attack it directly through the liver, through the liver artery, which is what Dr. Louis did, uh, showed you this morning. Um, what I'm going to show you now is just walk you through sort of a drug development talk of how we take a drug that looks promising or we think might be appropriate and then bring it forward. Well, we have to first do, no matter how many mouse experiments we've done, we have to do a phase one trial where we demonstrate safety. Safety is always the key whenever we're talking about a new drug. And we have to understand that not only how is it handled by the body, what are the major side effects, but what's the best dose that we're going to eventually test it in, in patients. The only way to do that is to, is to actually do it in people. Now, it's not to say that we don't hope that the people who enter the phase one trial have great results. We certainly do. But we don't know how to use the drug until we do the phase one study. So the phase one study is typically for incurable situations. It's oftentimes after standard drugs have not worked, but not always. And it usually requires pretty healthy people. Pretty healthy people with cancer, that is. Which is to say that they have pretty good liver function, good kidney function, that they're up and around, they're walking, they're talking, they're eating. Uh, and so, so you have to be healthy enough to enter a phase one study. And it's usually a small study, sometimes just 15 patients, maybe 20. And the reason why it's small is because we want to get to that answer as quickly as possible so we can move on to the next study where we're testing efficacy. So we treat three patients at one dose that we hope is safe. It's not always safe. And if it's unsafe, we have to go down to a lower dose. If it's safe, then we go up a little bit. And we keep on going up until we see some sort of toxicity that would say, well, maybe we shouldn't go any further. So we try to define an optimal dose of any new treatment, any new drug that we test. And that's what the purpose of phase one study is. Well, if the phase one study looked like it was safe and we still had reasonable feelings to say, well, this is a good drug for this disease, or in particular, if during the phase one trial, somebody with that disease happened to have a good response, we say, well, let's go after it in a phase two study. In phase two studies, we're actually testing the effectiveness of the drug in one disease type. So you might do a phase two study in colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and a different phase two study in neuroendocrine tumors with the same drug, but you have to do different, uh, different studies. It usually requires measurable disease. So that means we need to have a scan that we can say, OK, that tumor is 2.3 centimeters in size. I'm going to give you this experimental drug. And two months later, we'll get another scan. And if it's 2.8 centimeters, I'm going to say that this treatment didn't work. And if it's 1.8, we're going to say, well, this treatment is working. So it's an early readout in the effectiveness of the treatment. Uh, it's often appropriate first line. So this doesn't, phase two studies, you don't need to have had every drug under the sun. Some people can come in and get this drug, uh, an experimental drug, as a first line therapy. 
And again, it's larger than a phase one study where there's 10, 15, sometimes 20 patients. This is oftentimes 20 to 50 patients so that we can gather an experience with that drug in that disease and say something statistically meaningful at the end of the study, such as it works for 20% of patients, or 30% of patients had no growth during their study, or 50% of patients had a wonderful response. If it looks promising in phase two for that disease, then we graduate to phase three. Now phase three is where you test the effectiveness of that drug with whatever the standard therapy is for that disease. So you have to have a comparator. That, that means you have to have a randomization, which means that a computer determines which treatment you get, not your physician, not you. A computer determines which, which treatment you get. You either get a standard treatment or you get an experimental treatment. Now, there are lots of ethics involved with this. If there's no standard treatment, if, you can say, if the oncologist says in their heart of hearts that there is no standard treatment for a disease, that's perfectly fine to have a placebo as a standard treatment, as, as your comparator. So you want to see whether this treatment is better than nothing, because so far you have nothing for that disease. If you have a good treatment for that disease, you define that as standard treatment, and then you want to see if the experimental treatment is better in some way. And sometimes our, our experimental treatments happen to be standard treatment plus an experimental drug versus just the standard treatment. Okay, so people uh, oftentimes don't like the word placebo. They don't like randomized trials. It's actually used fairly infrequently in, in cancer research. And when it's used, it ha it's only in sp sp specific situations where, where it's ethical and it makes sense. Um, again, the purpose of the randomized study is to assess not only does the, does the tumor shrink more, but how well are we controlling the growth of those tumors? Have we stalled the tumor in its track such that it might take six months or nine months or two years before that tumor starts to grow? The only way you can tell that is by doing a randomized trial, one, one treatment versus another. And because of the statistics of this, you need a lot of patients. The FDA demands that we have statistical rigor in determining whether some treatment is better than a standard treatment so that they can improve it. It means lots of patients. So as you can imagine, for a rare disease, it's hard to do 500 patient trials. It would be hard to do two trials in the same, disease, same rare disease in, in one country. So how do we design, how do we interpret these? Well, first you have to design, you have to decide what group are you planning on studying? And uh, this morning we talked about how heterogeneous the world of neuroendocrine tumors actually is. And we used to do studies that said, okay, anyone with neuroendocrine tumor was, would qualify. But we can't do that anymore because we now know that there are such huge differences between different neuroendocrine tumors based on where they come from, based on their grade, based on many of the things that you heard earlier today. So we have to decide, are we going to do a study on poorly differentiated or well? Are we going to do it on, by the site of origin, only pancreatic, or only uh, ileal carcinoid, ileal and penicil? Does that patient have to have growth of their tumor in order to get in the study? Or if they've had a stable scan for the last three years, would they still be eligible for the study? It, it, it matters because if you have one arm where everyone's has stable disease and you show that this drug prevents growth, nobody's going to believe it because it wasn't growing anyway, right? So some studies require that there's some evidence of growth on a scan, and then you get the study drug hoping to keep it from further, growth, further growth from occurring. Uh, and then some, some studies are first-line studies, some are second-line studies, meaning first-line is not previously treated. Others are allowed uh, multiple prior treatments. This randomization or not, not all studies need to be randomized. That parachute study will never be randomized, right? Uh, but uh, most studies need to be randomized in order to get FDA approval. Uh, placebo or not, crossover or not. Crossover means that if you get on the placebo arm, well, that, meant, that wasn't really what you, what the reason you joined the study, but let's say you get the placebo arm. Um, if at the point that your tumor starts to grow, the question is, could you then cross over to get the standard drug? So we try to design studies in which there's a crossover arm. How do you measure success of an experimental study? You could measure success by, does the tumor shrink or not? Well, if you made the tumor disappear, that's called a complete response. If you shrink it by 30% or more, that's called a partial response. 
If it doesn't change significantly, that's called stable disease. Any one of these might be a reason to declare success in a particular tumor, but it has to be carefully defined in the, tri in the trial. There's something called progression-free survival, which really means time until the tumor gets worse or time until the tumor grows significantly. Some of our newer targeted therapies don't shrink tumors so much as they keep them from growing. And the way we measure that is, well, how long does it take before they grow? And if it takes two years to grow on one treatment and it grows in one year on the other treatment, well, I'll take the two-year two -year one if it's an easy treatment. Again, always balancing things that we didn't talk about in the panel is quality of life is a function of both the quality of life affected by the treatment and the quality of life affected by the disease. Uh, of course, overall survival is nice. It's very hard to do overall survival studies with very slow-growing diseases. We'd, grow, uh, we'd all grow old, fortunately, waiting for the results because people uh, with slow-growing diseases tend to live a long time, even off of treatment. And so that's, that's probably not a realistic expectation for many of the neuroendocrine studies. So translational research, so not all, re not all clinical research is just trials, therapeutic trials. And uh, er Lauren alluded to this earlier. Uh, only through biobanks, uh, collecting tissue, uh, and, and correlating that with clinical data can we gain a better understanding of this rare disease. We have to correlate the molecular features. That's not just the genetics, but also the proteins in the, uh, in the tissue with how the, how the disease behaves in a person. Uh, we need to identify potential molecular targets, and that was the exciting work from Hopkins that Lauren shared with you briefly, that some of those pathways represent targets. Just so happens we already knew about that because the mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus, we already know is effective, but it may help tell us who will have the best response to that treatment and who will, who will not benefit from it. There's a potential to individualize therapeutic decisions. Someday we'll look at, uh, at a, a selection of genes turned on or turned off, and they'll say, well, okay, okay, I'll turn around to my shelf and say, this is a drug for you. And this one doesn't work, but this is a drug for you because you had the right genetic makeup. And then the potential to increase the efficiency of clinical trials. If we already knew that, that it was only going to work in 30% of people, and only those people had a specific genetic vulnerability, then we could just select those patients with a genetic vulnerability and then test those. And it might speed the access, speed the approval of, uh, through uh, drug development and spare patients who would otherwise not uh, benefit from a treatment, the, uh, well, go ahead and move it up, the, the uh, clinical trial that they would otherwise go on. So sort of a preclinical, which we're hampered in with neuroendocrine because we don't have good laboratory models. We're working on developing them, but we just don't have them right now. Phase one, any kind of tumor, small studies, sometimes very good studies. So if, if you're looking out there for trials, phase one trials, because they're not disease specific, sometimes are the best trials you're going to get with interesting drugs. Phase two are specifically for the disease. Um, and uh, usually only available at, at uh, academic cancer centers. And then phase three are more broadly available because we need two to 500 patients. So those are sometimes international trials. 